welcome to another episode of Chats Chat. Join Chad Chilius and me, Dax Castro, where each week we wax poetic about document accessibility topics, tips, and the struggle of remediation and compliance. So sit back, grab your favorite mug of whatever, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Chats Chat podcast. Thanks for joining us, and we'd like to remind any of our audience members out there that if you're interested in sponsoring our podcast, to reach out to either Dax or myself on LinkedIn to discuss sponsorship opportunities. My name is Chad Chilius. I'm an Adobe Certified Instructor, as well as Director of Training Solutions and Principal at Chax Training and Consulting. And my name is Dax Castro. I'm Director of Media Productions here at Chax Training Consulting, and Chad and I are both certified as Accessible Document Specialists by the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. And if you'd like your certification too, head on over to accessibilityassociation.org slash certifications. We are also actually certified as, a, well, Chad's an Adobe, certified Adobe instructor, and I'm a certified PDF accessibility trainer by uh, Adobe themselves as well. And we're getting ready to go to Adobe Max, right, Chad? Yes. Yes. We got uh, a couple of weeks, I guess, two weeks now. Uh, less uh, than, uh, very, less very than. much less than, yeah. right? Yeah. So. so we'll be heading out to LA uh, for the Adobe Max conference. Uh, we're both speaking there, yep. which is, which is super cool. Um, and then, and then I'm going to do an early exit to head on over to M enabling uh, back on the East Coast, and uh, so so we had a busy week coming up, right? <laughs> wanted man, that is a wanted man. Um, yeah, my sessions for Adobe Max, I have three that are completely full. One is that mostly full, and I'm doing a new session for first time Adobe Max users or goers. And uh, I've got more than 300 people already signed up for that session. Oh, that's so, super cool. So um, that's going to be awesome. I'm going to be giving away some swag. I'm going to have some Max with Dax t-shirts and some other stuff to give out. So it'll be, it'll be awesome. I'm, I'm super excited. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I just, I just took a peek. Uh, I currently have 3,700 people enrolled dude, in my session. That's awesome. So yeah, that's, that's a, a great turnout um, for, for that, for that session. Awesome. So. Awesome. Well, today is our 100th episode of the Chax Chat Pod Chax Chat Podcast. Can you believe that, Chad? Well, it, it's kind of like when you have kids, right? You know, and and like one day all of a sudden your 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 son or your daughter is 16 years old. You know what I mean? And and you know, I look at this and I look back to like our first podcast that we yeah. did. You and I, at least I was wet behind the ears, right? I had uh -huh. no podcast experience at all. And, and here we are like a hundred episodes later, like yeah. we've done this a hundred times, Dax. Yes. Right? Yeah. And actually there's probably a few that haven't made the, made the cutting room floor I, that are on the cutting room floor that didn't make it to air. I think there were, I think we've only recorded two I was that just were like, say. that were like, uh. I don't know. Like after we I think did that it, one we're was like, too much uh, in the weeds. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe we don't want to set that one out, and you know, so so definitely so so. So um, not too bad. Like like yeah. overall, like you know, so if ninety eight out of a hundred made it, that that's not a bad uh, track record. I would say. Yes. No, I agree. And and I for those of you who are wondering about the koi pond, right? So there are two camps here about the koi pond. Half of you or some of you say, stop talking about the freaking koi pond. Others of you are like, I can't wait to hear more about the koi pond. In fact, Willow Spoon Creative, um, she helps us out on our doing our, uh, some of our transcript, uh, said, I am so hooked. I cannot wait to hear more about the, the Koi Pond. I can't wait to hear the next level. So I will tell you after this podcast directly, we are doing the last concrete pour. And then I'll be able to just basically do the window dressing, which is putting the stone on the outside, putting the glass in, and uh, just really kind of super all of the superficial stuff um, with the last step, probably a few months away or maybe a month away, um, is putting all the pumps and all the, the filtering equipment connected to it. So we're getting there. It's I'm super excited. No, that that's awesome. That's awesome. And and then there's then and then there's the third camp, the Chad camp, 
that says, Dax, I can't believe you spent that much money on a koi pond. You don't know how but, much money I spent. I'm never telling you. <laughs> well, I, I know I, you, you did tell me, you know, yeah, uh, it's, it's more than I, it's, it's more than I want, but you know what? You, you, have you ever cool. finished a project and gone, you know what? I wish I would have done this, or I wish I would have sure. done that. Sure. This is one of those projects where it's impossible for me to say yeah. that. There's yeah. no, I can't, could not have made it bigger. I could not have made it nicer. I could not have made it more. Chad, I've got recessed LEDs in the countertop where you're going to put your hands. They're pouring that, well, we're pouring that part today. And I'm recessing LEDs into the concrete itself. It's going to be amazing. And I just, I'm just going to be so happy to be able to be finished I, with I it. I can't wait to see it. I can't yeah. wait to, I can't wait to come out and see it. I, I really yeah. can't. All right. Um, I, I'm not doing anything that exciting, but but one thing I am doing that that uh, I found interesting. Um, my neighbor mm -hmm. has a black walnut tree. Okay. And for years, I've watched these things drop and yep. rot in her yard. You know, and I, I found this Instagram. They're called Homegrown Hand Gathered, mm -hmm. and and the guy shows how to harvest these walnuts, dry them out, crack them. And he makes this walnut honey butter Ooh. out of, out of these walnuts. And so wow. that's my current project. Every morning I go over to my neighbor's house and I, I collect all the walnuts. And so, so that's my, my thing. Well, that be I'm doing be right careful now. though, because the outside husk is very, is toxic. And uh, there's actually a, a way to boil them to make dye. You can take the black mm. walnut juice and make a, a, a tie dye kind of stuff out of it, but it's definitely. Well, my fingers are stained yeah. right now. Um, yeah, from yeah. no, <laughs> be careful of that because it is, it is toxic. So it is, yeah, is not yeah. stuff you mess around with. So anyway, cool. today we are going to talk about um, some color contrast. So, you know, we know, you know, we've talked about Vengage. Uh, they were a sponsor on our podcast. In fact, they're going to be on um, not uh, a week from this podcast episode, uh, to talk about their program more, but you know, I follow them on, on, on LinkedIn and one, the other day, um, they posted about a pie graph and, um, they posted the, um, uh, th their, their features for their, their, Vengage software. And if you don't know, guys, Vengage is like, can, can, uh, it's like Canva. It's an online design tool. But the good thing is all the accessibility is built in. It's really cool. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the great features. If you want to know more, listen to last the last two podcasts. We, we are the last few podcasts. We've talked about some of those things. But what he he said in this in his post said, um, he was showing someone some of the features of, a, of, of designing a pie graph with patterned fills in them. And he said that the person he was surprised because the person who he had showed them to said that he said, however, during the demo, a user candidly remarked that he was struggling to distinguish between the pie segments. So we, we say, you know, that color is not the only means of communicating information. So therefore, if you've got pie slices and they all mean something different, you need another marker to distinguish one pie slice from another. Usually we have a legend on the side and maybe just numbers inside the pie or maybe nothing inside the pie uh, and you're just left to figure it out, right? And so he added all these pattern fills, but they became more more confusing. And we see this a lot, of, a lot, right, Chad? With yeah. the idea of too much, there is such a thing as too much accessibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, e even, I, I would even argue as a sighted user, you know, sometimes when I look at a an element like that and every single piece has a different pattern, it, it's almost overwhelming, right? right? Like there's almost too much information to try and process, right? And, and so I, I think that's what you're going to talk about is, is that, you know, in some cases, less is more, right? right. You know, um, and, and the, the key, the, the key objective here is to make the elements distinguishable from one another. And, and you could do that using a combination of color and uh -huh. patterns. Right. Um, and, and then, you know, while we're talking about the pie grass, I mean, the, the, the other, 
the other really important thing with a pie chart is not relying on the color alone right or the pattern alone right and when you add labels yep that makes it crystal clear right, right. i mean get I mean, rid I of never... your legend and put yeah. the label legends are always confusing they take something that's typically a square a pie graph is typically a square if you took out the legend but it's a rectangle when you have the legend because you have to have this kind of other space in the design so that the legend is off to the right and now from a cognitive ability yeah. thing it's it's a, a a harder lift and we should talk about something here for a second chat cognitive load is a term I use quite often. And, and my good friend, Doug Shepers, uh, I watched a couple of his videos. And if you've ever want to know more about um, uh, data visualization, um, he is a great person to, to look to for answers. But he talks about cognitive load. And cognitive load is the amount of brain power it takes for you to stop and digest what it is that you're looking at. And while you and I might look at a, a, a the cover of it or a magazine page and immediately see a bar chart with a hundred different um, uh, bar segments in it, we would probably not sit and read every single one of them. Our brain looks at that and goes, oh, it's a bar chart. There's a lot of values there. I'll look at that later. Or I might look try to look a little deeper. But we don't immediately process every single data point as we go. But someone who's using a screen reader, if you say, oh, well, I'm going to give them the table instead because there's a hundred values, you now have forced them <laughs> to read a hundred values times how many rows and yeah. that cognitive load, there is no way they're going to be able to draw the same conclusion you can in two seconds by looking at these bars going, oh, look, September was a terrible month. They've got to read through all the values go through all the processes and try to put that all together. And that can be a huge cognitive load. So when we talk about cognitive load for a pie graph, we're really talking about how easy it is to tell one, the value of a slice and the difference between one slice and another. And adding labels, like you said, Chad, is really the easiest way. Get rid of the legend, mm. you know, and, and we even have a sample. So I'll, I'll put this up on screen. So, We've got a sample here of Eugene's pie graph. I, I've moved the data points into the pie slices and added the labels. Now it's crystal clear in a very short amount of time what's going on, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and honestly, I mean, I've experienced that. Like sometimes when I look at a pie graph, if I have to coordinate between the pie graph and the legend, it's a cognitive load for me. But right. like and, and and there's a really great book. I don't know if you've ever read this, Dax. It's called Don't Make Me Think. Okay. And and it's it's really about uh, web usability, but the oh. principles apply in the same way. And it, it's really about like you, you know when you're designing a web page, don't make the person work for it. Right. Make it very easy to consume that content and 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 read that information w without having to without that cognitive load. You know. Well, you know, when we're talking about this pie graph, right? We, you and I were talking earlier about the thickness of the lines, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and, and that the question we always get is like, how thick does a line need to be? Right. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, like is one point thick enough? Do I need to make it two, three, you know, what, whatever it might be. And, and that's a tricky question to answer, isn't it? Right. I mean, well, there's no hard and fast rule, but you know, I guess that the short answer is thick enough so that visually you can easily discern between those pieces. Right. And the goal is make it easy. So what's yeah. easy in this case, the line stroke is like one point, but if I were to come in here to this line weight and, and change it to three point, like you said, now that's much easier to tell one pie slice from another. But I mean, and in this case we have labels, Right. So we're not, it's very distinct as to what's going on. Right. But if someone were colorblind, these slices for consumer product and public sector, in this example, for those who are only listening, we've got a pie here with uh, six 
five slices that's uh, consumer production, public sector, education, finance services, and technology. And in each of these pie slices, there's a value. 3, 41, 27, 12, 18, right? So for a couple of these, 12 and 18, the slices are about the same. And, right? and they're like really small, right? They're, well, they're, 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 they're a, you know, they're about the same size. So it, if from a size perspective, you don't have a differentiator, but they are the darkest and one of the lighter colors. So there is a color contrast between those two. But the other three slices for consumer pr uh, production, public sector, and education, they're very close to the same tonal value. And so having a differentiator, an extra differentiator, reduces the cognitive load. Obviously, there's labels here. We can see that that's a difference. But the cognitive load for someone who's visual like me, I'm looking at this. I have to now look at the values, then go look at the labels and go, OK, my brain has to separate those two as separate objects. But if I were to simply add a patterned fill... If I go to this one and I add a pattern fill to that, now it's much easier for my brain to understand what's going on here because each of these pie slices is super distinct, right? Yeah. Now, you you might say, well, some of them are, are, are not, but the ones that are close together, the ones that have an adjoining side have a much different contrast or textured fill. And you you could look at this chat, and would you say that that's visually distracting? The the pattern, yeah, I don't think so. Right, I you don't know? think it's it's overly distracting. Versus when you put a pattern fill in every one every of them, one. then yeah. now you've got something that is really, while technically it passes, the the user experience is much more uh, confusing, I think, or much more. There's a lot of the, a lot a lot greater cognitive load to dis to differentiate that item. There's a lot more to process. Yes, right? I mean, that's that's the, what I was trying what, to. Get. Yeah, th there's a lot more you have to process. But um, I, I mean, and and we could argue. I mean, that maybe that one not so much, but the other one that had like the lines going to the wedges. I mean, fundamentally, you could make every wedge black, right? Right, and it, the label is going to distinguish them. Now, right. I wouldn't recommend that, right? I'm not saying that that's a good idea. But, well, but it's not a bad idea, plays... though, Chad, because if you make them all a single playing field, if you eliminate the color as the differentiator that and, and you use a numbered value and a label, that's perfectly fine. In fact, yeah. you might say it's easier to understand than sure. if you used colors all the way around. Now, it goes back to, well, the, you're now you're you're just making the argument of accessibility needs to be boring, that it all has no. to be bland. And the right. answer is no, you just can't throw everything at it to make because then now you're swinging to the other side of the spectrum where it's way too confusing. So sure. limit the amount of textures that you're using. Use them only in the slices that need co uh, extra contract. Uh, you know, um, and, and, uh, and when they have that extra contrast, that was the word I was trying to get out. Um, <laughs> then they are, uh, much easier to dif discern from one to the other. So, yeah. you know, this goes back to designing with accessibility in mind, right? Our class that sure. we have, um, and, and when you understand the user experience in this case, cognitive load is what we're trying to differentiate color blindness cognitive load, those things, um, cognitive load affects everyone, regardless of your ability in some way, shape or form and 100%. colorblindness affects, you know, up to 11 or 12% of the of male population. So you definitely, those are your two considerations that you should be thinking about. And when you understand the user experience for both of those things, good and bad, you can start to design in a way that it makes things easier. And it's not a, oh, we've got to change this. I've already built it the way you, you need to. And adding those strokes, making them three point instead of one point, not a big change. Putting a pattern fill in one slice, not a big change, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I and I'll give you a, I'll give you an example of cognitive load from a different perspective. I hate going into Borders or Barnes and Noble bookstore. <laughs> okay. Because it's so overwhelming to me. Oh. 
I have no idea where to go. Gotcha. Right. There's so much information for me. And and I don't experience this many places, but that's one place where my mind just gets so overwhelmed. I have no idea where to go. Right. Okay. I have so many interests. There's so many things that interest me that I just uh, I'm I'm completely overwhelmed in that environment. Input. It, Remember yeah. that old yeah, that old yeah. that old eighties robot movie? <laughs> input, input, input. I forget what yeah. that was called, but uh yeah, that was a flashback there. Sorry. I, I find a- Amazon a lot easier because typically when I go to Amazon, I have a purpose. I'm sure. going there for a specific reason. I'm looking for a book and, and, and that's a lot easier where when I go into Barnes and Noble, even if I have that purpose, mm-hmm. it's like small, shiny objects. I'm like, Ooh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, right. like I get so distracted, but anyway. Awesome. Well, you know, the other thing I wanted to talk about today, um, was you and I discovered, you had asked me a question about, uh, you were troubleshooting something for a client, right? And they had set up a, uh, a table and the table was seemed like it validated all the way around. It, it visually passed, it passed using callus PDF, go HTML. And for those of you who don't know, callus is a really great program Mm -hmm. for visually seeing if you've got errors in the code of your table in, in, in fairness, pack has a screen reader preview as well. And they both operate very similar. I just prefer the colors and the style in, in the PDF go HTML. Right. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. I mean, I, I just, I think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like, and again, it's not a, not a criticism, but it's, it's kind of like the PAC 2021 report. Uh Uh-huh. It's pretty. Right. It's concise. It's elegant. And it's nice to be able to hand that to the client. They can interpret it very easily, you know, and, mm-hmm. and kind of similar to what you're saying, you know, um, y- y- you know, it, it, the, the, the PDF go HTML plugin, it, it's just a really nice interface. It, it renders the content very nicely. And, and, and again, I use it so often to troubleshoot tables, you know, like when I'm getting a regularity error in a table, mm-hmm. PDF go HTML makes it stick out like a sore thumb. You know, you you view the table and you're like, Oh wait, there's a, there's a square missing, you know, that this, this row is not occupying the full amount. So it makes it easier to troubleshoot. Right. So what we figured out is that, well, what you had asked about and, and what we had clarified is that there, when you have a table that has row spans and column spans, you have to set the row span or the column span uh, in that in that document correctly, right? And right. so we teach how to do that, and we show you how to manually add it when you're when you're going to add um, add that to the document by going. You can go into the table property of that cell, and um, and and. Uh, assign a manual row span or column span, right? Right. There are two values when you set that up and one, well, there, when you make the, 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 uh, when you open the property to, to, to create the new value for row span, there's the, the value of what you're trying to, to, to make, which is row span. So you type in the, 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 the name there and then you add a value of whatever it is, two or three or However whatever. However many rows or columns you want it to span. Yeah. Right. But there is an, a data type dropdown that you have to specify whether it's an integer, uh, uh, name, or what was String. the last one? String. Right? String. And so, and so you, if you don't, what we discovered is, if you don't set those right in the table and you set a row span of three, but you left it as name instead of integer, the table looks like it passes, but it will fail pack because pack will say yeah. it's at a regular table, right? Yeah. I, I, I mean, to be fair, it failed the Acrobat checker as well as the pack checker. Gotcha. Right. And, and, you know, I previewed you previewed it in PDF go HTML and it looked great. Like, like right. everything looked perfect. And I even went in to the property and I looked at it and I'm like, oh, there it says row span of 
five. You right. know what I mean? I was like, this is, this is perfect. This was great. And it, it was a hard thing to troubleshoot. And, and finally I said to the client, I'm like, can you send me the unmodified version so I can walk through it and, 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 you know, try it out on my own. Right. And, and he did. And, and when I was doing it, he happened to notice that when I was setting that property, the the type I had to change to an integer. Right. And right away, he's like, oh, wait, I wasn't doing that. And I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, the error that Pat gave you was bizarre. It, it, like in no way did it tell you what the problem was. Sure. Like, sure. like Pac was just like, this is broken. I can't do this, right? And I, I wish it was a little smarter, you know, and say, hey, this table, you know, whatever. Um, and so when I did it and I ran it through, it passed no problem. And so we discovered that he was doing it incorrectly and, you know, we, we resolved the problem. So guys, what we have is a sample table and on the sample table, it's got the second row in this table has a row span of five. Right. And we can go into the tags property. So I find the TH that is that cell and I right click on it and go to properties and then go down to edit attribute objects, right? Not edit tag, but edit attribute objects. And in here, it's a properly remediated table. It shows a row span of five and you can see that it says slash row span with a capital R and a capital S and the number five. But let's go ahead and delete this. Um, for a second and we'll add a new one. So if I go to new item, the key is row span, capital O, capital R, capital S for row span. And the value is five. But if I leave the last one of value type as name, there's array, boolean, dictionary, fixed point, integer name, and string. If I leave it as name and I hit okay, we get the same we get the same thing except for row span has the slash and so does the number 5 before it didn't have the slash because it's a name you'll see that slash and that's how you can know whether or not it's set correctly because right now if i go in and hit change item what does it show me nothing it just yeah. shows me the value it doesn't you, tell you me what can't type of object the type anymore. Yeah. 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 So, so let's delete this again and let's go in and do a new item. And we're going to say row span again, capital R capital S P A N a value of five. And let's just say we change this to a uh, string just because we made a mistake. If I hit, okay, it's, oh, hold on a minute. You got to delete the old one. No, it's deleted. Oh, That's okay. interesting. I guess I have to close this, go back into edit attributes and try again. Right? Oh, there it is. Delete item. Hit OK. OK. Now, if I go in and do new item, row span, value of five, and I change this to string by accident because I didn't know what I was doing and I hit OK. Now look, it says the, the slash, it says slash row span, but the number five is in parentheses. So guys, what I'm, for those of you listening and not watching, the takeaway here is the way that the number five is displayed in the object properties will tell you if it, that inner, if that value type is set correctly, it should be just the number five on its own with nothing else. So let's yeah. go back and hit delete. And we're going to go in and do new item again. Oh, I think we have to close this out again. Hit OK. Yeah, I think you're OK. I, th I think, yeah. And that then we'll go back weird, in yeah. and do new item, row, span, capital R, capital S, value of five. And we're going to change the value type to integer. Integer is a number. Anytime you put a number in a value field, you always want it to be integer. And we hit OK. And now you can see that it is a slash row span and then just the number five with nothing else. So hopefully that's a really good tip to help you when you're stuck on a table that you just can't seem to validate that that has merge cells in it. Maybe somebody set the row span. Yeah, up. yeah. And, and just to add to that, like when you're adding that property, 
when you hit the tab key and it goes to that drop down, you could type I. Yeah. And it'll switch over to integer. Like sure. I, I do that all the time. It's just a you know efficient way of doing it. But but I also wanted to mention that a much easier way to do this is via the table editor. Right. But the problem is that the table editor fails very quickly. Yes. Right. And and especially when the row span has not been defined yet. Yep. You open up the table editor and you're like, what's going on here? Yeah. Like you, and a lot of times it's hard to select the cell that you're trying to modify. Well, and, and I'll tell why, you a trick. Go ahead. Well, that's why you have to take this approach that you just showed. Because sure. sometimes the table editor just doesn't work. And so you just got to go to the tag, add the property. And then when you go back into the table editor, now all of a sudden it's going to look more like what it's supposed to. Exactly. Because it understands what's happening. Yeah. I'll, I'll give our listeners a, a bonus tip here. What I do is I try to drag, once I'm in the visual editor and the table lines are all messed up, I try to drag a box as big as I can within the table boundaries to select as many of those cells as possible. And then I go in and I set I, I, after I've selected them, I'll right click and select properties and I'll set all of them to a row span of one and a column span of one to basically reset the table to its core values of just one block, right? And then typically it'll either fix it and I'll be able to select the right cells. I'll be able to now go in and select a cell um, or it will show me that there's one cell that's just like way out and I can go find that one in the tags tree and then select that and do exactly what we just did. So set that property correctly. Um, so that's a really good way to kind of reset the table. But remember, you're going to get that warning that says, hey, do you really want to do this? And oh, yeah. And and yeah. so remember, always save a backup. When you go yeah. start messing with tables, save a backup because you you don't want to destroy your document and and all of a sudden be stuck in a hole. I always say like when you get that dial, when you're in the table editor and, and you go to properties and change the row span, you get that dialog box. I always tell people the translation of that dialog box is if you don't know what you're doing, you could totally hose this document. Yep. Right. That's exact. That's basically what that thought, that message is saying. Yeah. So, so yeah, like before you go into the table editor, guys, recommendation, make a copy of that file and work on the copy. That way, yep. if you screw it up, you can always go back and, and try it again. Yeah. Uh, I, I still do that to this day because yep. typically I know what I'm trying to do, but you just never know what way, when you make that. And, and then once you apply the wrong row span or column right. span to a cell, it's hard to troubleshoot. It's hard yeah. to find which cell has that property, you know? Right. And that's why I like going through and setting them all the one to one, because I'll just reset them all. And then I'll go back and go one at a time and start setting them. And that usually it's kind of like clearing to zero. Right. And then, and then now I'm going to just start resetting those cells one by one. And usually I can figure out there's a empty cell somewhere or something, you know, weird. Well, well, here's a little tip, Dax. If you click on that table tag uh -huh. and right click and go to table editor. Yep. If you right click anywhere and go to, oh, uh, sorry, right click anywhere in the table. Sure. And go to, oh, uh, sorry, table editor options. Uh-huh. You can turn on show cells that span multiple rows or columns. Sure. And then visually, when you click OK. Here, let's make it uh, red. Whoop, I already have a red. Yeah. Let's make it light blue. Oh, there we go. Look at that. So yeah. now visually, you could see which cells have a row span or column span applied. and, uh, and Which is and great some... until your table has a lot of colors behind I it. Know, and then it I you know, know. I've had that happen before. I'll go in and because the TH right now, for those of you not seeing this, the THs right now are set to pink, but because I've got blue on top of pink, it looks like a weird color. So I have gone in and set these properties to different values when I'm working on tables with lots of colors. Um, yeah. But but what we have, it shows every one of the table cell, just for our listeners, um, 
for for their every cell that has a merged value it merges either across a row or down a column it is a light blue color and it's very distinctive allows me to see exactly where my row spans uh and column spans are so great tips awesome cool well good stuff chad good stuff yeah likewise all right guys well listen i think that concludes another well, that concludes our hundredth episode. So exactly. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in uh, on this uh, momentous occasion. We, we, we appreciate your your support, and we we appreciate you tuning in. Um, um, and, before you, before you, let me interrupt there for a second. Yeah. So we're gonna post this. I always post the podcast on LinkedIn. So um, if you are listening to this podcast and you have gotten something out of what we've done. It's helped you on your journey. Um, you know, I'm just staring at Chad for a hundred episodes. I don't get to, <laughs> we do, we do get really nice emails from people. Yeah. Yeah. But if you'd like to leave a comment either in the YouTube video on our YouTube channel or on the LinkedIn post where I post this, um, feel free, you know, we'd love to hear from you. If this is really helping you, um, Go find this post on LinkedIn or go look at our, our YouTube channel is, is, um, you know, PDF, uh, it's a, a youtube.com slash at a one, one, Y. And yes, I did mean that on purpose at a one, one, Y and, and, and leave a comment. We'd love to, to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we would definitely appreciate it. Well, again, guys, thank you so much for tuning in and, uh, you know, just a reminder, um, if anybody is interested in sponsoring our podcast, reach out to Dax or myself and uh, we will we will see you next time. My name is Chad Chilius. And my name is Dax Castro, where each week we unravel accessibility for you. Thanks, guys.